This is Lynn Fraser with the Killaby Center for Recovery and the Radical Recovery Summit. I'm really delighted and honored to be here with Dr. Stephen Porges, the founder of the Polyvagal Theory. Dr. Porges is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and professor emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. He has a long and distinguished career as a scientist and a researcher and someone who is very engaged in the community. And one of the things I've been really impressed with over the years is how you've, you've really interacted with clinicians so that your research is actually affecting how people are working with um, psychology and therapy and autism and all different kinds of things so that these theories that maybe wouldn't ever get out into the world are. So can you start by just kind of giving us a little bit about how you got into that connection with people like Bessel van der Kolk and how that started? Well, it's actually an interesting journey because you're right. I'm a scientist. I'm an academic. I'm a laboratory scientist. But I'm also, let me use the term, a dreamer. I try to figure things out. I was actually, um, uh, the model I was using was uh, recently was I was basically saying that my life's been about a Rubik's Cube where you have information and you try to uh, look at it through different lenses to solve major problems. Now, interestingly, the problem I was trying to solve in the 1990s was uh, why did uh, a neural pathway called the vagus, why was it protective but also potentially lethal? So when you uh, study uh, newborn babies, high-risk babies, and study babies during actually the transition from intrauterine uh, to extrauterine survival, uh, one of the key factors is to look at whether the heart rate drops with what's called a bradycardia, heart rate slowing up, and it's massive rapid changes, and it's a hypoxic response. And that's been assumed to be a vagal reaction. Yet uh, the beat-to-beat -beat variability, what people call heart rate variability, and what I focus on is the respiratory rhythms, on the heart rate are protective and they're known to be vagal also. So it created what I call a vagal paradox. So now we're going to go to the Rubik's Cube. So how could the same nerve both be lethal and protective? So how can the nerve of health, growth, and restoration and protectiveness, how could it also kill you? And so I focused on that. And I, the solution was that there really uh, was one nerve, but inside that neural a conduit were different pathways. They came from different parts of the brainstem and they evolved for different adaptive functions. So the newer mammalian one uh, basically was a regulatory one that uh, was on the journey, uh, the journey uh, of evolution of vertebrates to become social, where in a sense it became a nerve of sociality. And when we start talking about addiction and other things, we realize that sociality gets disrupted. And so the issue was this well-regulated autonomic nervous system was really an autonomic nervous system that was really enabling uh, conspecifics, those are the same species, to come close together. It was a signaling system. It was a co-regulatory system. And I found out that, guess what? Under severe challenges, that system basically goes dormant so that we can go into a fight flight. And when the fight flight doesn't get us to where we want to get, we shut down. So we basically, in looking at that model, which really parallels evolution, so as an ancient vertebrate, we basically had a shut down defense system. And then through evolution, we ended up with a spinal sympathetic mobilization system. And then at the transition from reptiles to mammals, we got this newer vagal system that was linked to neural regulation of the muscles of the face and head, which enabled us to cue those of our species, uh, whether we were safe to come close to. So with vocalizations that had intonation, we became accessible as, as different vertebrate species, I should say different mammalian species evolved. And so our nervous system was able to take the cues of vocal modulation or intonation and that became a calming mechanism. And guess what? Think of the mother with the baby. Or mm -hmm. think of if you have a dog, how do you talk to your dog? Right. But remember, we often don't talk to our spouses or our children as gently as we talk to our dogs. 
because with our dogs, we realize that the intonation carries with it intentionality. And when we start talking to other humans, we forget that. We think it's all intentional through the vocabulary, and we get really messed up. So the journey was I was able to unfold this model of three systems coming on by evolution, and they reverse their, their sequence under challenges or under threat. So you start using more and more primitive system. And when the trauma world saw that, they said, aha, now we understand the immobilization response. We understand uh, dissociation. We understand that people are functionally, uh, physiologically uh, death fainting, pretending not to be there. And they're also numbing their body. And so they're making adaptations of this initial very important adaptive reaction. So the arms went wide open. I got into this group, and then I started to learn. And so we're talking about late 1990s. And the theory was first conceptualized in 1995. And I would say I've been a student of human behavior since then. And it's folded back into how I see things, and I start understanding more and more about the unification or the integration of social behavior or mental health and physical health, that we start to see ourselves not as a social there and our body here, but this integrated nervous system that evolved with such, I'm going to say, miraculous features that one of the most important, quote, medicines happens to be the person across from us and how they treat us. So we keep uh, in our patholo path pathologized world and pharmaceutically oriented world, we try to fix things with interventions without understanding the beauty and the power of our own systems that really can emerge with tremendous self-healing capacity when the nervous system is not under threat. One of the questions I like to ask is, do you believe that everybody can heal? I use a different term. I say, let's optimize our resource. So let's say that, uh, see, again, we start thinking in terms of broken and fixed, uh, disease healing. Uh, we all have ranges of who we are. And part of the problem is we don't optimize whatever we have. So the issue is take a more optimistic viewpoint and say that everyone can optimize whatever resources they have. Okay. Yeah, and so we'll get into, in terms of my perspective, which is really that top-down effect, meaning the bottom-up signals, has to create a narrative of welcoming. So in a sense, we have to honor our bodily feelings. We can't, uh, in a sense, evaluate it and say they're bad, because that will just promote more uh, defensiveness and threat physiological. We have to say, wow, what an interesting nervous system I, I have. What can it do? So the narrative has to be shifted so that it becomes more one of respectful observation. And I would actually, in the world that you're in, it'd be witnessing. We're witnessing ourselves with respect, not evaluating ourselves without respect. Right. I found it so helpful for people to understand those processes so that they could get away from shaming themselves. Yeah. Well, it's so, in a sense, so simple, isn't it? Because shaming and blame, how's your body feel? Does it feel open, accessible? Is it going to, in a sense, recruit its own homeostatic systems to heal on any level? Or is it going to hunker down and protect itself from the world that we're in? The world that we're in basically uh, treats individuals like if they ramp up the motivation, the person will, will change. So make it worse so they'll get better without understanding that as you make it worse, the body has no place to go but down. Right. Yeah. So one of the things that you said, and I've been working with for years, is safety is the treatment. <laughs> yeah. But well, that's such it, a profound statement. It, yeah, well, uh, it just reminds me uh, about uh, invitation I had to uh, speak at the NIH on, in a think tank on they were interested in alternative things, and they brought some scientists in. And I want to talk about the power of placebo, which in a sense, the body's own uh, ability to heal itself. Well, they would have nothing of that. 
that that would I could talk about anything I wanted, but I couldn't use that as my title. But the issue is, you know, we're afraid of placebo. But if we th- rip that back, we're really saying that my body can heal itself, and I have belief in it. And so, what when we, in a sense, back uh, track to what we're talking about, and the optimism of a body self-healing is really uh, a different understanding of placebo. Rather than externalize it, we could internalize it and say, I have tremendous capacity if I can create a safe context where my body doesn't go into threat. Then my nervous system supports homeostatic function, which means helps me heal. But if we now take an integrated nervous system model in which we say that mental health and physical health are really part of uh, attributes of the same nervous system, then we start seeing as our body heals, our ability to socially interact and our mental states become more uh, uh, resilient, more uh, adjustable within the world that we're in. And the problem, again, I keep reflecting on what I would call problems of the myths that we've been taught, and especially those of us who are in the mental health area, We've been taught that mental health often has nothing to do with physical health, and which means we now have not listened to our body at all, because so much of the information from our visceral organs is going up and affecting basically the psychological, behavioral, and physiological states that we're in. And the top-down works in the same way, that if we visualize threat, guess what? Autonomically, we change. So we have to have much better appreciation of the, uh, I won't use the word duality, but the bidirectionality of mental and physical health and illness. Mm-hmm. And that it, it works both ways, that our physiological um, states affect our behavior, our behavior affects the physiological state. Profoundly, because all we have to do is conceptualize that if our body, actually, the metaphor is the old Star Trek movies where if they're getting into a dangerous place, the energy shields go up. The energy shields are using energy. Mm-hmm. Defense uses energy and diverts in our brain the ability to reach higher cortical areas because we can't, in a sense, be creative, be spiritual, be benevolent unless our bodies are safe. We wouldn't survive unless our bodies were safe. So people who are focused on meditation, the first thing is the context. This is a safe environment to meditate, meaning are the cues that your body's responding to, cues of safety, or the cues of threat. So what we now really would say is uh, safety is the treatment because if we remove cues of threat, the body can then move back into this calm or safe state to support its own health, growth, and restoration. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with meditation for people with a lot of trauma is that the internal cues from their thoughts in their mind and their hypervigilance in their body are not forecasting safety. They're forecasting some kind of threat. Well, I would even give you another uh, explanation. Is they're usually trying to do meditation or mindfulness exercises in the presence of others. And so the cues of people being around them, especially someone from behind, is really a potent cue of potential threat. Their body is not willing to give up its hypervigilance. Right, because, yeah, that makes sense. But I think where you were going was when they start using mental images, they start getting into scripts or uh, obsessive thoughts uh, where they change their physiology and they really have to get out of there. So you see it going in both directions. Right. Or in some meditation traditions, the instruction is to stay put (laughs) and just kind of sit and torture themselves, which is not helpful either. Now, I I have a, a, a projective test. And I, in my own, what I would ask a person, and that is, let's take... Uh, how you think of stillness. Mm -hmm. Uh, On one side, is it really where you want to be, where time expands and you can go different places? Or does it, in a sense, frighten you that you're falling into that abyss? So what you find in individuals with trauma is 
stillness is a frightening concept because it's it really translates into vulnerability. Uh, while uh, conceptually, for those uh, who, of us who do not have severe trauma, by not saying we have no trauma, mm -hmm. stillness is really where we would love to go if we had more time during the day. It's with and without fear is how I label it in terms of that immobilization. Immobilization without fear leads to, with another person, it's intimacy. Uh, just visualize a baby conforming on, on the breast or the chest of the mother. You see the two bodies kind of like fitting together, lovers mm -hmm. with each other. There, the notion that you're safe enough to be in the arms of another without being vigilant. Uh, that's really, I view that as kind of the, the goal in life, that our, our, our mandate is to be safe enough with another to both feel their presence to enable us to give up our defenses, but also to support them so they can give up theirs. Right. So that's pretty hard to do if you're in a trauma response, if you're immobilized, yeah. if you're in fight or flight. Well, it's, you can't do it because your body is saying it can't give up its uh, defenses. It can't give up its uh, energy shields. It can't give that up. It has to keep you alive because for many people who have experienced or survived trauma, uh, the violation of trust was the critical issue in the traumatic event. So if their bodies start to feel safe and relaxed in your presence, uh, it triggers an association, uh, unconscious or conscious, doesn't matter. The body will just react and become self-protective and defensive. And you can see that, it, you know, it, when you uh, would try try to instruct people to breathe slowly or to go into a meditative state, they'll say, "Can't handle this," right. and you, because it's really the body is doing what you wanted to do, but now those cues of safety and accessibility are now matched in the template in the memories with a, a vulnerability and in injury. And that explains the disconnection. Yeah. But th there's both, you know, the fact that you can see this occurring, witness it, it is also provides a, a portal of optimistic outcome because mm -hmm. now you can move people in and out of those states for very short periods of time to literally perform what I call neural exercises. So they start experiencing their body in this vulnerable state, but they're not really vulnerable as long as they have the agency to get out of it. And this is where breathing patterns or breathing exercises are helpful because mm -hmm. slow exhalations put you into that accessible, calmer, or more vagal state. And longer inhalations uh, basically energize you to mobilize. So you can go in with the knowledge that you have a toolkit to get out. And uh, this becomes, I mean, this is how a lot of the uh, breathing exercises, and these have long traditions, have been used to, in a sense, increase uh, resilience. Right, right. And a lot of the trauma-informed practices now are working with that knowledge of hyperactivity, hypo, yeah. and how to work with the breath in a way that's not alarming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot of the trauma therapies now, I would say they're... Uh, uh, Body informed or somatic oriented, and many of them are actually polyvagal informed, where they take the underlying theory of polyvagal uh, of polyvagal theory and embed it in what they're doing. And it's to me, it's if if you want to see a smile of gratitude, that's the moment I really feel that I've been able to do something because mm -hmm. you it, the theory initially I saw it as the personal narrative of changing the narrative of survivors, but it's done more than that. It's actually helped them understand not only their reactions, but a journey, uh, a journey towards healing. Right. right. And some optimism, too, that that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the other part for me was I think I've learned more about what it is to be a human from the world of traumatology than from everything else. Because with uh, uh, severe trauma, survivors lose uh, the elements that we love in life, the ability to co-regulate with the other, to feel safe, to be optimistic, to have a 
in a sense, a purpose in life. These things get pulled away from them. They don't have access to it. But what I have found remarkable is they all have the intention, when you talk to them, of having those things back in their lives. So we see the core root of what it is to be a human is to be safe enough in the arms of another. Right, right. I work with someone who's had severe trauma history, and she does ballroom dancing, Mm -hmm. and very much considers that part of how she regulates her nervous system and experiences joy and passion Mm -hmm. and those things that aren't so available to her in her regular life. Well, for her, you know, the, the notion of mixing movement with social engagement is really sounds like the most appropriate because dancing is play. It has some of the same features. So it has mobilization, meaning sympathetic activity, but it's contained or constrained with the vocalizations with the partner or the facial expressivity. And that's what team sports does. That's what other forms of play. So play and dance and movement are very polyvagal in form intuitively. So if, they, if, they, if the person were dancing by themselves in the absence of other people, it wouldn't have the same power. And in our society, we forget what play is. Play is co-regulation, it's interaction. It's movement, but giving the body cues that the movement is not aggressive. And when the body gets this integration of sociality with movement, that's, we get exuberant, we can get happy, we have the power of life in us. I was thinking when I was thinking about this earlier, about my grandsons who play together very well a lot of the time. They're 15 months apart, but they also have explosive fight responses. Yeah, well, let's actually dig into that for a moment as an example, because the explosiveness will usually occur when one individual uh, turns away. So there's movement, there's physical contact, but there's no repair or total acknowledgement that the physical contact was I had good intention. So if we watch, the model I use is watching dogs play. They teach us a lot. So mm-hmm. how does a dog play? They don't talk. They, they do make vocalizations, but they chase each other. Mm-hmm. And when they catch one, they do a light bite to the rear leg of the dog they caught. But how does the dog know that it's a playful bite and not an aggressive bite? They look at each other. Mm-hmm. Then they roll reverse. So the dog that was doing the biting is now the one that's being chased, and they're very happy. So the act of face-to-face interaction is diffusing the effects of movement, which can get our bodies worked up. And so when you're talking about your grandchildren, they're playing, having a great time. They're getting mobilized. But now there's a rupture because something happens. Someone gets hit or pushed, and that activity or that disruption is not repaired by a facial turn, a smile, a few kind words. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, that's interesting. And, and, you know, they get stubborn and it's like they get mad and then they won't make that repair in the moment. Right, because they've come up with what I call a moral veneer. It's your fault, not mine. So we, <laughs> we create that narrative and the narrative is always to place us or the individual as the hero or the one that's harmed. Um, as opposed to the ability to very rapidly roll reverse and see the position of the other, that flexibility. Right, right. So when we're talking about trauma as leading to addiction, yeah. um, let's talk about that a little bit. How does polyvagal theory fit into addiction? Well, I'm learning that it fits in very well. Uh, I, I, this has actually been a new journey for me because the addiction world, again, has started to invite me into it, and I start learning. And then I start to realize uh, addiction is all about trying to regulate your physiological state outside the realm of social interaction. So it's a replacement to regulate physiological state. So all you need to do is ask yourself, Individuals who have addictions, how well do they use social interaction or friendship relationships as the regulator 
of their physiology and you start getting the answer. They're doing it through an external source and not through the normal biological one, which is reciprocal interactions, co-regulation. So people who don't have trustworthy social interaction don't really have a, a possibility of, of, of that so much. Well, you're asking really, you're, it's a rhetorical question you're asking because you're in the world of addiction and you know already that most of them who come in for treatment, the vulnerability of, uh, in, in a sense, even dealing with the treatment is do they have a network of relationships? that are co-regulatory and can, I mean, in addiction, you might use the word support, but in polyvagal theory, we would say more reciprocal because the notion of support goes in one direction and a real relationship, you support and then you are supported. So it's that dialectic that bonds people and, and enables feelings of trust to spontaneously emerge. So in the world that you're working with in terms of the addiction, the simple question is, how trusting are these people of others in their life, too? Right. But I'm sure they have a mental image of a type of person they could trust, but they may feel that their journey has been a life of violation of trust. Right. So how, how do you work with that, then, knowing that? What are some of the steps people can take? Well, I, I would first of all caution uh, you and anyone listening or watching, I'm not a therapist, but, but but therapists do use some of my ideas, so I don't play one on TV either. But the the issue on this is uh, the rules are really relatively simple, and that is uh, the, the understanding of the physiological state we're in. So I guess the first rule is to honor and witness one's own physiological state. And for people who are addicted, part of the journey is not to feel your physiological state. Mm -hmm. So we, you could start, in a sense, with uh, a treatment model that had on the front end kind of a learning about one's own body, learning to understand that intonation of voice is really a projection of physiological state because mm -hmm. it's regulated through the vagus, a different part of the vagus than the one regulating your heart. Uh, facial expressivity is reflecting a uh, physiological state too, uh, so that we start understanding that warm, acceptable voices and faces make us feel better. And as we feel better, we start having those types of voices and facial expressions. So we start learning from that. But I think the very first part is this awareness of the physiology of your gut feeling or your heart beating. And I think for many people who have very strong addictive tendencies, they've already numbed out that feedback circuit. They're, they're not really that aware of what's going on in their body. So in my own strategy, I want to really teach people about their own physiological responses. So uh, I want to do physiological monitoring where people can see their heart rate. They can do posture shifts. They can do breathing. And they can see that their body is responsive. And when it's in certain states, they have certain emergent properties, either being more accessible or more vulnerable, depending on how they feel about it, or feeling more aggressive. So breathing patterns can get people mobilized, uh, and, and it can support their anger, or it can calm them down. And they can see this in heart rate patterns and breathing patterns. So part of my strategy would be to uh, do a psychoeducation with physiological monitoring. And given the fact that wearables are really very inexpensive now, I really think that that will rapidly find a home within addiction centers. Uh, biofeedback is part of that strategy. But before you try to change it, you have to know what it is. So I think rather than going immediately to biofeedback or neurofeedback, there's going to be a psychoeducational part of learning and honoring about our biology, our physiological reactivity, and not to think of it as being so uh, oblique to the experiences that we're having. Mm -hmm. And the way you've laid it out, it's very understandable. I mean, this isn't hard to understand. It's a hierarchy, there's certain reactions, there's certain states. It's yeah. It's complex, but it's not 
the the structure uh, is is both very intuitive and understandable. And the point is that if we are to be a social species, we can't be reactive to threat, or, or an environment cannot be bombarded with cues of threat. And so that becomes the rule. And it's very strange that like educational systems are just loaded with cues of threat. And the kids are telling you this. They don't want to go to school or they have gut problems. They're telling you, they're, they're broadcasting that their bodies are under threat. And what do we do as parents? We say, go to school. Yeah. Get over it. I've talked to many people who've said their children did a lot better from March to June yeah. not being at school. That even with COVID and everybody be so, being so stressed, their children were better regulated, not as upset. I think that's Isn't that, to me, that's a frightening commentary. Because mm-hmm. as I reflect as myself back decades, is that I love to be around other people of my age. I love that. But what they're telling you is that their bodies are not seeing their age peers as supportive. They're seeing them as bullies or aggressive, and, and they are we they don't want to be there mm-hmm. and we as a society say you have to be there get over it and we use terms like tough love and things like that mm-hmm. the children are telling you what they're experiencing and we they don't have the agency to change it we mm-hmm. do and we have to such change our educational model to be more respectful of the child's reactivity you start talking that way in certain arenas and people get really upset because they think that the kids are going to be feigning. So they're a feigning problem is, you know, pretending that they're ill because they don't want to go to school. The point is people like to be with people. It's a very powerful motivator. Mm-hmm. And it's these other features of being humiliated in public or being teased or physically being abused are what says, don't go there because my body is under threat. Mm-hmm. And that is a uh, that's really prevalent in our culture right now. There's so much trauma, and so many people are not regulated. Yeah, and, and in part, it, it's really an interesting society. So, if you stand back from it and you ask the question, uh, do we reward mobilization or do we reward thoughtfulness? Right. Uh, we seem to think that. Mobilization leads to productivity, meaning anxiety. So what is mobilization as it gets really integrated into who we are? We become an anxious society. We can't sit still. And we do things. But are we doing creative things? Because to do creative things to solve really big problems, we need to think and not merely react. And that requires a body that is safe. Right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about the face. Yeah. <laughs> and the muscles around the eyes and the um, how we signal. And in particularly, I'm interested in the middle ear. And yeah. partly because I was physically assaulted in, the, in a 2005. And after that, I developed a sensitivity to loud noises, like in restaurants and yeah. play in a band. And I have to wear, you know, the headphones and stuff and and when you talked about the middle ear muscle yeah. not being very responsive can you go into yeah, that? sure well you know you just live through a polyvagal explanation or i uh, it's really relatively simple because all we need to do is distinguish between listening and hearing so hearing is when you go into a sound chamber and you hear sounds and you do fine listening mm-hmm. is how our nervous system reacts in the real world and we have to think of listening as being linked to our autonomic state. So if we're in a state of uh, threat, what are we going to be listening for? What's the adaptive reaction? Listening for predator type sounds, lower frequencies. Um, mm-hmm. And what that to do that, the middle ear muscles, which are regulated in the area of the brainstem that controls the vagus, so it becomes this ventral vagal area, that area loses its neural tone. And rather than uh, tightening up our eardrum where low frequency background noises functionally are bouncing off the eardrum, now they're being absorbed. And the energy of low frequency background sounds is much greater than human voice. 
So you lose human voice and background sound, but you become very attuned to predator sounds. So your nervous system did the right thing at the time you were under threat. Now your nervous system has to be convinced that it's no longer under threat. And the issue is, how do we, quote, retune our nervous system? And that's where uh, the middle ear muscles and the muscles of the upper part of the face that regulate this orbital muscle around the eye, the orbicularis oculi, there, a, a branch of the facial nerve goes to the upper part of the face and then goes to the middle ears. And a branch of the trigeminal, the one that's involved with ingestion and, and actually jaw movement as well, uh, that one goes to the middle ear muscles and regulates your station tubes as well. So you have two small, the, the smallest muscles in your body in the middle ear. One is called the stapedius, and that's regulated by facial nerve. And the other one is the tensor tampini, and that's regulated by the trigeminal nerve. And, and the point is that the neural tone to those muscles decreases when we want to detect low-frequency predator sounds. When we are safe and our autonomic nervous system is calm, neural tone goes back to those middle ear muscles, and now those middle ear structures filter low-frequency sounds, and we hear human voice. So our ability to process human voice gets enhanced. So rather than focusing on your trauma history, we could talk about kids who are frightened in school, and they may have difficulty in their language skills because their bodies are now tuned to be defensive, and they may not be hearing the verbal commands. They may not be processing the sounds and extracting the speech because their body is now prioritizing sounds that are related to predators. So uh, in that optimistic theme, uh, if you create the cues of safety, you can actually rehabilitate or retune the neural regulation of the middle ear muscles. And as you do that, you also trigger better autonomic regulation. So it's this bidirectionality of how our nervous system works. So I developed an intervention that basically uses hyper-prosodic uh, vocalization. It takes vocal music and then puts upon it or superimposes on it uh, certain algorithms that amplify prosodic changes or intonation changes. So in a sense, it's giving our nervous system distil the distilled essence of vocal cues of safety where the body cannot reject it. And it's doing this uh, in, in short periods of time. It's, there are 10, 30 uh, minute sessions. Well, it's usually done as five one hour sessions. And this, this actually will change not only the neural tone in auditory processing, but it, when it got the procedure and technique got a patent, and one of the claims was that it was an acoustic vagal nerve stimulator. That was also because we were able to show that. But this all makes sense because it's the same brainstem circuit. Now, that was working very well with children who have spec autistic spectrum symptoms and language delays and all, all these uh, features that we often find with children who have language delays and auditory sensitivities. And then the trauma therapists start to use it because what happens with trauma? The face doesn't work, the middle ears don't work, meaning that you're hypersensitive to sounds. And hypersensitive to sounds, but hyposensitive to human voice. So human voice gets lost. So in a you don't want to go to restaurants, you don't want to go to noisy places because you can't extract the human voice from the background sounds. So the trauma world wanted to try this, and what we started to learn was, guess what? Cues of safety to people with trauma histories are triggers. So the point was that some people just reacted to this calming, and so we had to, in a sense, become trauma-informed in delivering this, which really meant go much, much slower, titrate it, watch the client, and we're getting really remarkable results. And many of the therapists have embedded it in their treatment models, uh, like somatic experiencing and other somatic uh, ones where they're using this protocol, which is called the Safe and Sound Protocol, 
to using it as a way of getting the body a little bit more relaxed before they go in with their own interventions. So, but they may be using it five, 10 minutes in a session, uh, rather than doing it one hour a day for five days, it may be 10 minutes a day, a te- or it might be 10 minutes once a week when they come in for their other. So they're titrating it, and they're getting the person to move more rapidly on their clinical trajectory. So it's actually retuning up the nervous system. Yeah. It's really, in a sense, it's retuning the autonomic nervous system and what I call the social engagement system, which is this whole neural structure that regulates the muscles of the face and head. And this is part of our evolutionary uh, journey. That is where the muscles of the face and head became in our brainstem linked with our physiological regulation. So that cues of safety downregulated our defenses, in a sense contained us, made us resilient. So it, it's really this journey of sociality. And if we think about trauma histories, or we think in terms of autistic spectrum, or behavioral problems in the classroom, they're not so, there's an asociality to those experiences. And this really kind of gives another explanation. Uh, it's, it's really, to me, uh, it, it's remarkable uh, to, for me to see these rapid changes and seeing, in a sense, when you see someone uh, be functionally transformed in a few hours, you say, how could that happen? Because what happens, you see the face change, the voice change, and suddenly they're spontaneously engaging another person. And you're trying to figure out how, well, where did this come from, especially when someone carries a diagnosis of autism? Where did this come from? Why would the person lean over to me and say, hello, Dr. Porges? Why would they do that when three days before they did this? You know, it's like, uh, because the nervous system now became safe. And now the spontaneous attributes of our nervous system could now be expressed. And this is why I have this optimistic viewpoint of optimizing whatever we have. And when I'm really saying this, we're not, we're not curing autism. We're enabling people who have that diagnosis to be more resilient and more socially interactive. Oh, right. And then as they become less of that flat face, yeah. push, pushing away, then then yeah. that's to build. Yeah. So the point is autism is a good one to kind of think about for a moment because the diagnosis is a powerful, lifelong diagnosis. Yet the features are all behavioral used for the diagnosis. So we know that the end point, we can see it in the face and the behavior, but we don't know the underlying causal pathway. And the issue is what happens when we change autonomic state? What happens to the features? How many of the features, in a sense, disappear? And for some, diagnosis disappears. But that doesn't mean we've cured autism. It means that the features that we've used to define autism may be much more fluid and plastic than we think. Mm-hmm. And, and then we can even overlap that with the world of trauma, because we now end with foster children, which gives us another pathway, that is children who come out of environments where they're, they don't even have mental images of being safe in their home. And so you see the bodies of these children as being very reactive. Well, you see the bodies of autistic children being very reactive. It doesn't mean that autism comes out of abuse and trauma, it, but autism carries with it this retuned autonomic nervous system. And the question is, forgetting about the causal pathway, can you retune that autonomic nervous system and optimize the potential of that individual. Right, right. So before we get off of the of the hearing and listening, I wanted to ask a question about misophonia. Yeah. Um, how does that relate to this? Because it's not just sounds; there can be other things too. Well, how, how do you think? Of that? I thought it was linked to um, again uh, hypersensitivity, especially to lower frequency sounds, because bodily sounds have low frequencies in it. I think it's more complex than that. I think there's a component of that, but I think there's really a powerful association or in a sense a higher level brain association. Um, there, the, the intervention I developed has been used with a few individuals who have had misophonia. It's not a controlled study, 
and they have gotten, in a sense, they could deal with it better. Okay. It doesn't mean that they lose the sensitivity, uh, but they're in physiological states now in which their sensitivity is dampened. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, the issue is, you know, people with this, it's very disruptive to their lives. And the world was actually teasing them that it, it can be something real. And the answer is it's very real to the person who experiences it. And the types of sounds tend to be really clustered. So we know on one aspect, a lot of the low frequency sounds, uh, bodily noises, but there's also must be a association that keeps that those sounds very empowered as disruptors. Right, right. So all of what you've been talking about really seems like it comes to, we need to heal our nervous systems. Yeah, well, we basically saying we need to feel safe and our nervous systems will heal. So the yeah. answer is the directionality of our causality. So if we say we need to heal our nervous system in the world we're in, we want to take a drug, we want to do uh, a certain procedure. But if we say that our body knows what to do if it's not under a state of threat, it's, it's the notion of giving healing back to the body and not make it external to the individual. Our nervous system has a program of, of repair and healing. And part of the problem is that when that program is now overwhelmed, it may actually shut down and people don't recover, they don't live. And we call these things uh, multi-system shutdown. And COVID becomes one of the living, ex living or dying examples of this, that when the body says, can't take it anymore, I'm gone, I'm out of here. And we start seeing it on the primary levels of respiratory function, which is autonomic, and immune function, which is linked to the autonomics as well. When we're looking at people who've had most of their lifetime, maybe, of not being very social engaged, maybe they've cried and they've been betrayed so many times and they've been hurt and they're really lonely and isolated and not very trusting. So how how could some if that's somebody who's listening to this, what would you suggest for them? Well, I mean, you state the problem, and the problem is they're not trusting. And the question now is, how do you convince a nervous system that it can trust those around it? And interestingly, I've gotten some emails that have been critical of me for providing the instruction set, and what they said it would then be used by uh, predators. Oh. So, so the issue is, yeah, intonation of voice, uh, facial expressivity, gesture, our presence is really the modulator of our defenses, so our, our defenses of others. So the, the super co-regulators, who are the great therapists of the world, or the great friends, they walk into a room, and suddenly people are there. They're in their bodies. They're present. And so we need to learn from them. It's not a manualized task. Again, this is so much of our Western world that we think we can train therapists through a checklist or we can train teachers through a manual. The issue is so much of humanity or our capacity to learn, to be social, is all about the cues of those around us that take our body out of a state of threat. And we have to focus on that. And there are ways of doing this. So I was been really focusing on the interpersonal way. But in building clinics or building classrooms, we have to design them so that the sensory cues of those environments are not triggers, uh, triggers of threat, meaning that they're well sound buffered from so low frequency sounds don't come in. They're not sensory overwhelming. That uh, you need lots of natural light, but the windows can be raised up. Uh, you, some people are hypersensitive even to fluorescent lights. You bounce the light off the ceiling and it comes back down. There are ways you can design your environments, but being quiet enough and not having too much glare. Our nervous system will see that as calming. So we need to think about this. And I'll give you one, one example that I lived through, and that was I was giving a lecture to a psychiatric group, and one of the psychiatrists was doing a case study, and I was the one that was supposed to respond to it. 
And he puts on this video and he says, first, I got to apologize because we are making major renovations to the floor above my office. And you can hear the jackhammers going and all that because and he was doing his session. And the answer is we have to be aware that the low frequency sounds of jackhammers are evolutionary cues of predator sounds. Uh, and we have to be respectful that our body responds to it. So we have to have a better understanding of the sensitivities of what it is to be a human, which is both good and also creates these other vulnerabilities. We are sensitive creatures. And if we start hearing predator sounds, uh, the priority is to shove that social communication, that interaction, that co-regulation to the side and deal with the proximal life threat that a predator brings. And when you're dealing in the world of addiction, and you're dealing in the world of trauma, it's proximity and the primacy of life threat to that organism that is disrupting it. And now we have to navigate with that first by taking away the cues that mm -hmm. could elicit that or trigger that and respectfully uh, transmitting sufficient cues to get the system to try it out for a while that this is safe. Oh, right, right. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Uh, just on kind of a practical level. I love what you were talking about with autistic kids um, in schools and how they're being treated very much like kids with delayed learning. Mm -hmm. And it's actually quite a different set of circumstances that would be helpful for them. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the history of diagnosis of autism is an interesting history from a very rare uh, developmental disability to a very common one. Uh, from those initial, the old the diagnosis, if you go back to the 1960s uh, and even before, uh, retardation or uh, mentally slow was never viewed as an attribute. It was something else. But as it, it's gotten more and more common, a significant portion of those with a diagnosis don't have language. Uh, which is, uh, mm -hmm. and so if we cluster those who were autistic, with those who had severe language delays, that helps explain some of the so-called uh, epidemic. If the diagnosis is different, um, it doesn't mean that it's not important. And the other thing that I find really interesting is that the sensory component is a major part of that diagnosis now. And I think the sensory component has flexibility, and that's where I would like to be helpful with. So let's talk a little bit about um how people can get a hold of you. So safe and sound protocol, which you were talking about, I've been impressed with that for so long and curious. I'd love to try it actually. Yeah. Um, but how can well, people get a hold of that? And then you have this new Polyvagal Institute too. Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning that. That's polyvagalinstitute.org. And uh, we created it as a not-for-profit to, in a sense, uh, further the educational mission uh, so that people can uh, can learn more about polyvagal theory and we'll start having courses on it and we will actually start developing course material for different what i call special interest groups like addiction like education like medicine so that people will have core groups that they can work with uh and see it in their own areas um so i'm really kind of thrilled with that it's a little bit overwhelming because you know everything you know there are good ideas and there are ideas that become uh consuming and overwhelming and i just kind of like want to i want to enjoy and watch things grow uh there's also my own personal web page which is stephenforges.com uh the safe and sound protocol can be accessed from my web page it's being marketed by a company called integrated listening systems you can click on my web page and find it and go directly to a landing page on theirs and integrated listening system does trainings. Uh, over, I think about 4,000 uh, therapists have been trained in, in, at any given time. There's close to 2,000 therapists using it. Uh, they went remote in a sense, they provide it now as an app. And that was released in mid April. And I got an email back about two weeks ago and that they had over 100,000 sessions delivered remotely since mid April. And that's another, that just gave me a big smile because, but the researcher in me says, told them to get to work to get the surveys and the assessments on their dashboard. Cause I saw now 
uh, 100,000 sessions uh, translates to at least 20,000 uh, individuals and say, oh, this is real data. We could be getting all this data and providing uh, information to potential consumers about probabilities of improvement, uh, features of the children who or adults who would feel better. I want that information so that I can now recreate this or Great. create new tools. So anybody who has any auditory sensitivities? Uh, so the, the simplistic one, uh, and this was my own uh, personal agenda, was to kind of remove out of move out of the diagnosis, although my work started with autistic individuals. I want to pull back from that because I didn't want to be in an arena of basically saying, look, I've cured autism, you know, and they said, well, what else, what are you going to do next week? I didn't want to, I didn't want that. I wanted to say, look, we can optimize the life experiences for individuals who have this diagnosis. And so now you're not, in a sense, saying you, anything uh, that's miraculous, but you're, in a sense, helping reduce the symptoms that are so disruptive to the family and the child. So yes, auditory hypersensitivities is a good entry to it. And when that gets rehabilitated, you start seeing spontaneous social engagement behaviors. And you also start seeing reductions in visual hypersensitivities, which I found really interesting, and tactile hypersensitivities, and selective eating, which is really, you know, so when you get into your body, uh, you, you, you basically explore food as well. So you see this whole array of a re-embodiment of, of individuals who have done this. And this is something very simple, like passively listening uh, for a total of five hours over a few days. So I, I felt it was a good start to, uh, in a sense, providing a tool to allow a nervous system to remove, move from a state of threat to a state of safety. And in that state of safety, the person who goes through that experience functionally is being re-embodied. They're feeling their body and they're experiencing it. And if we tie it all into polyvagal theory, it's when your body is no longer under threat, sociality is the natural output. And why is it? Because sociality links to co-regulation and the reciprocity to help you maintain that physiological state that promotes sociality. And in the world of addiction, sociality is withdrawn or not available. And the pharmaceuticals or the other addictive behavior is these valued attempts to regulate their body. Right. So do you see a, a big difference between substance abuse and behavioral addiction? I would say I'm a novice yet. Um, uh, I'm, I'm working into this and learning. I've also been pulled into another area, and that is chronic pain. And that overlaps with addiction. And once you see chronic pain from a polyvagal perspective, you see it as a reaction to threat as well. And you see the nervous system being in this hyper-sympathetic, defensive, often mobilized state, uh, and a withdrawal of the social engagement, the facial expressivity, and the calming mechanisms. So pain becomes this unambiguous signal that our body's under threat. So then it starts all making sense. Uh, one of my colleagues on the think tank that I'm part of with on chronic pain is always talking about people giving up their anger. And I tell them, don't get to those higher levels. Their bodies are in states of threat. And that is what's going on. Giving up anger, you're angry to defend. Mm -hmm. They're just more convergent cues to inform me in my, in my intellectual model building that chronic pain is very much associated with the body being under threat. It's un unambiguous. Okay. And so when you have the polyvagal the syndrome and that you have all of those things that, are, that go on with that, and fibromyalgia is one of them. Oh. So that's probably what you're talking about? Well, with pain, it can be uh, even more excruciating. It can be back pain. It can be any form of pain. I wanted the pain group to think in polyvagal terms, and I really was talking about three different uh, clusters of pain, cranial nerve pain, like severe trigeminal pain, mm -hmm. uh, gut pain or visceral pain, and spinal, skeletal motor, muscular pain. Now, these are, in a sense, different poly polyvagal theory 
tells you about what part of the autonomic nervous system is really focal with both. And so I don't know if they all follow the same rules within polyvagal theory, but I thought it was kind of interesting to see the different organizational model one could come up with. But it appears that in all three cases, there's a withdrawal of the, let's say, the social nervous system, the social engagement system. That it doesn't matter where the locus of pain is, the body's in a state of threat. Interestingly, with gut pains, which I'm actually doing research on with adolescents who have functional abdominal disorders, uh, their vagal regulation is low. And there are syndromes, and you may have heard of one, which is called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. It's a hypermobility. It's people who are uh, double-jointed. They have a lot of anxiety. But we're finding a metric uh, through autonomic measurement it seems to be a very good uh, a model of showing a, a, what I call an inefficiency of how the vagal break or the vagus works. So they may have vagal tone, but it's just not effectively working. And with Ehlers-Danlos, they have lots of visceral pain and somatic pain. So it, it's, it becomes a good model. And I think this metric may lead us to a better understanding of the medically unexplained symptoms like fibromyalgia, like other forms of dysautonomia. So I think the laboratory research is going to be helpful uh, to provide that psychoeducational, where people can see, in a sense, the, the root or the causality of what they're experiencing, and it's not merely something in their head. And then uh, from a polyvagal informed perspective, I think certain neural exercises can be developed to rehabilitate. And these can be breathing, they can be listening, uh, they can be social interaction. Uh, they play as a neural exercise if we respect it for what it is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what an exciting time to be working in this field. Well, you know, you open your eyes and you see it all around you. And uh, I would say it's double-edged because no, no longer can I look at people's faces and, and without saying, oh, <laughs> you know, it's like, so when we look at uh, uh, the presentation of uh, supermodels and we look at their upper part of their face, rather than say, oh, what a beautiful person, we say, what was their history? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we see uh, this glamorization of those that have been severely traumatized. And mm -hmm. I'd much rather see a smiling, exuberant face than anything that a supermodel with the flatness. And that's part of what they're trained to do. And there's a lot of uh, anorexia and abuse within that culture as well. So we have to realize that we want to see smiling faces. Our body likes that. But yeah. And one thing I thought was very interesting that you said was, we can't really feel compassion if we're down in the sympathetic responses or in dorsal. No, we have to not no. trust and connect. No. We we have to realize again. You know, in the U.S., we've gone through not merely the pandemic, which has been totally out of control, but we've been going through a really a conflict within the political arena that makes everyone feel unsafe. So messaging is important. Messaging about pandemics, messaging about the future, enables our very complex nervous system to create positive narratives with positive outcomes. Uh, feeling, uh, in a sense, chaos or uncertainty is a signal to our nervous system of threat. And we've been living through threat for quite a while in, south of the Canadian border. We've been under a lot of threat. And this changes who we are. We lose our compassion because when bodies are in states of threat, their mandate is to survive. When they are in states of resilience, their mandate is to connect and to support others. Right. So everything we can do to help those conditions is going to help us too. Yes. I mean, that's the beauty of being a human. The core. So what, what my research and personal journey has taught me is that the core of what it is to be a human is beautiful. And it's this other crap. It's the fence shields that get in the way and make life uh, uncomfortable because once the defense is up, you also get aggression. So uh, as long as you can create uh, cooperation, collaboration, reciprocity, 
the world is just beautiful. And, and in, in closing, what I like to say is, as an academic, the most frustrating thing for an academic is this feeling that their ideas can, will never be translated into reality or into the world. And I would say we can use words like feeling blessed, but the word I now like to use is I feel a true sense of gratitude. I finally understand the word. And that is I feel a true sense of gratitude in that my ideas have been helpful to others. It really makes me feel that I'm a real human being. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah thank it, it's a, you know, it, on a personal side, it's a wonderful journey. So there's a lot of optimism that will continue to come out from me over the years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'll look forward to, you know, keeping in touch. And, and uh, I've been working a lot with Deb Dana's work as well. Some of those exercises in her book are just so great. It, Deb is remarkable. And, you know, I just feel so fortunate to have met someone who can take the principles and understand them on a very deep level and move it into the clinical world. Because that's, I'm not a clinician. I can talk about clinical things, but I'm not one of you. And so uh, I feel just really wonderful about that. I really, it's very special. Well, thank you so thank much you. for You're being wonderful. here and, and talking with us. And I just, I value what you bring to the world so much. Well, well thank you, Lynn. And I thank you for the opportunity. Welcome to the 2021 Radical Recovery Summit presented by the Killaby Center for Recovery. This is Lynn Fraser, your moderator. This year, our theme is Feel It, Heal It a new paradigm of recovery, featuring a diverse group of thought leaders and innovators, people who are working on the ground in the new field of addiction recovery. Go to RadicalRecoverySummit.com to sign up and watch free.